Hi, in my previous video, I reviewed this ET829 scope meter, and in this video, let's open it up and take a look inside. And before I do that, I do want to take out the battery and take a look at the power consumption situation here. So let me just remove the battery cover here. And like all the other scope meters we have seen so far, this scope meter also is powered by these two lithium ion cells. So let me remove those and uh, let's take a look at the battery consumption here. Now I'm powering the unit from an external power supply set at uh, 4.2 volts. And you can see that the current draw, currently the unit is off, is at 0.22 milliamps. You notice that I'm only powering one of the battery position here, and that's because I tested earlier that uh, this unit actually can be powered by either one of these batteries. So this actually works as expected. And now let me flip it over and uh, let's power it on. So let me power it on very carefully. And we are over current. So let's uh, change it to the amp mode here. Let me power it off. And you notice actually the current doesn't drop back to 0 0.2 immediately. That's probably some powering off sequence. And although the screen is off, it's still consuming some current here. So let me change it to the amp mode and we will do the measurement again. Now let's uh, power it down. The multimeter mode is drawing about uh, almost 400 milliamps. So let's uh, change it to the other modes. Let's uh, do the oscilloscope. And it's drawing about uh, 400 milliamps. And how about the both channels on? When both channels are on, we're drawing about 500 milliamps. And let's turn on the arbitrary waveform generator. Yep, so it seems that basically with each of the additional unit turned on, we're drawing more and more power. Now, with everything on right now, we're drawing about uh, 500 milliamps. I don't know the exact capacity of the battery as it's not printed on the battery itself. But let's assume it's 2.5 amp hour, which is pretty typical. So you will have roughly 10 hours of operating time when all the instruments are on, which is the worst case scenario. And from that perspective, the spec is pretty accurate. So let's uh, take a look to see if we can turn off the channels again. and go back to the voltage measurement mode. Now it doesn't seem that the current dropped that much. And uh, let me power it off again and try to start it up from the beginning. So let me turn it back on. So it's interesting that you see that when we initially boot up into the multimeter mode, the current draw is significantly lower than once we turned on all the channels. And you can see that once we turn on these channels, and even when we go back to the multimeter mode, the current draw is still elevated. So not entirely sure if there's any way for us to be able to change that once we have enabled the oscilloscope. You can see that if we go back to oscilloscope, even if I turn off, the channels, it doesn't really impact the overall current. As you can see, this is clearly a two board design. We have this top board and also we have a board underneath, as you can see that from these uh, capacitors that we have the cutout for. And those capacitors are mounted on the other board underneath. 
Now, for some reason, I wasn't able to actually remove the top board just yet. I have removed all the screws here. You can see that, but uh, the board is still seems to be stuck. So we'll have to take a closer look at what is going on there. But let's first take a look at the top side of the board. Towards the right, you can see this is the input section for the digital multimeter, and we have two of these fuses, and we have some high voltage cutout slots, and by the look of it, we have a single PTC here. Now, we don't see any MOVs on this side. And towards the top here, you can see we have some inductors. These are presumably part of the DC-DC converters used to generate the various rail voltages used by this board. Towards the left side, we have two of these tin cans. These are the shielding cans for the input channels of channel 1 and channel 2 of the oscilloscope. And further down in this section, by the look of it, we have two of these 4051 MOXs. And there are two chips here, and by the location, you can see these are probably used as part of the signal generator output section. I'm just guessing here, as I can't see the markings of these chips. But this is the output from the signal generator. Okay, as I expected, these two boards are actually indeed soldered together via these two pins. So you can see, let me just show you here, there are these two solder points, and uh, these are connected to the two headers down here, this one and this one. To be very honest, I'm not entirely sure why they need to solder these two boards together, as the four screws here are actually enough to secure the board down uh, like this. So by the look of it though, this one pin here is ground. This pin, I'm not sure what it is. But the only thing I can think of is it's essentially creating a low impedance ground connection between these two boards. But beyond that, I don't see any other reasons why would you need to do this. On the side of the board, you can see that we actually don't have a whole lot going on either. We have a MUX here, this is a 4052. And then we have this, uh, by the look of it, MXT2088. So that's essentially a dual channel 100 meg samples per second ADC. Now, this does match the spec of the 200 meg samples per second maximum sampling rate of the scope. This essentially is the same ADC used in the O1 oscilloscope that we did tear down before. And in the O1 handheld, the sampling rate is spec'd at 250 mega samples per second, definitely out of the spec of these uh, 100 mega samples per second ADC. So I assume that in those handheld oscilloscope designs, they probably overclocked this ADC, but here they didn't overclock that. And on this side, obviously, that's your digital multimeter section. We do have a proper current shunt for the 10 amps measurement. Unfortunately, the markings on the main chip for the digital multimeter is sanded off. I can't see what it is, but nevertheless, we can assume that's probably one of those 6,000 counts multimeter chip, and we have found in many other multimeters. And here we have this uh, EE prompt that is used in conjunction of the multimeter to store calibration constants and uh, some other settings for the multimeter. Although there's no MOVs on this uh, multimeter section, we do see some properties on here. You can see the input section. Here we have these uh, four resistors. That essentially is to handle the high voltage from the input. And you can see we do have proper isolation slots on the common terminal and also the input terminal as well. And that is pretty much all there is on this main board. Now, this board definitely is uh, built to lower the cost. And you can see that from a build material perspective, it doesn't have as necessarily as many components as what we have seen in the old one and even the hand tag teardown that we saw earlier. Overall, you can see the build quality of this board is actually quite decent. There is no botch wire anywhere that you can see on this main board, and also all the components layout are fairly good as well. Here is a close-up view of the PCB at the bottom. Now, this section is a battery charging controller section, and this chip is SLM6600, which is a lithium-ion battery charger controller chip.
Now, I'm not going to take this board out as I assume that the majority portion of this board is essentially to handle the display and the keyboard. But we can see there is a programming header out here. So presumably there's another controller at the other side as well. Again, this uh, front panel display board probably is used in different models. As you can see here, we do have a footprint by the look of it for either an RF module or some kind of a Bluetooth, I'm not entirely sure, but certainly this board does not have that in place. Now you can see here the silk screen. Here it says it's a ET202D display board. So not entirely sure if this board is actually made for this specific unit or is something interchangeable with other units as well. And that pretty much wrapped up this chair down. I will have to reassemble this and solder these two boards back together, which I will do off camera. Well, I hope you enjoyed this chair down and learned something new. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.